And this is for Grant Davis. <laughs> if he's on. I'm wearing my shirt. <laughs> hey, Drew, do you think we should give him a couple more minutes or go for it? So it looks like we're waiting for City of Sonoma and Valley of the Moon. Is that correct? Valley of the Moon's here. Or Matt's here from Valley of the Moon. For, hey, Matt, John do you know if any of your directors will be calling in today? I, I don't know if John's joining us or not. Okay. Must be bad traffic, Drew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Fergie, are you on the call? Anybody from City of Sonoma on the call? So Susan, um, there's a Thank quorum, you. so I recommend okay. we just get going. All righty, then let us begin this meeting at 9.03. Um, Easter, are you all ready? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. And um, a little bit of housekeeping stuff. Um, need to remind and their full name for roll call um, and when making comments and asking questions. And we also need to remind staff to mute their phones, microphones when they're not speaking. Um, so those are just a little housekeeping. And with that, um, may I have, can you please do a roll call? Yes. So for WAC members, City of Katati, Susan Harvey, City of Katati, City of Petaluma, Dave King, City of Petaluma. City of Bernard Park. Uh, Jake McKenzie, present. City of Santa Rosa. Uh, Dick Dowd, I've been uh, I've replaced uh, Vice Mayor Victoria Fleming. Um, so I represent Santa Rosa now. Welcome, Dick. City of Sonoma. North Marin Water District. Jack Baker, present, North Marin Water District. Town of Windsor. Sam Sandler, Town of Windsor. Valley of the Moon Water District. Marin Municipal Water District. Larry Russell. Tech members, City of Katati. Big Sky. City of Petaluma. Kent Carruthers, City of Petaluma. City of Runner Park. Mary Grace Pawson, City of Runner Park. City of Santa Rosa. Jennifer Burke, Santa Rosa Water. And Peter Martin, also TAC alternate, Santa Rosa Water. City of Sonoma. North Marin Water District. Drew McIntyre is here. Town of Windsor. Andy Potter from the Town of Windsor. Valley of the Moon Water District. Hey, have Matt Fulner here. Marin Municipal Water District. Uh, Paul Sellier. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that Easter. Um, then we will move on to public comment. We'll take in public comment on non-agenda action items. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, and then I will ask um, this as if there 
public comments. Do we have any live public comments? I do have Oops, one, I hand see one hand. Let me uh, enable your mic. Thank you. All right, please go ahead. All right, hi, good morning, it's David Keller. Um, could you do a, a, a just a run through of who from the public is online as well? Uh, yes, we can ask that. Hold on, attendees. Any other public comment? Drew, did you have any um, public comment, either written or um, by voicemail? Madam Chair, I did not receive we either didn't do it. comments. Okay, um, then um, Secretary Perez, know that our attendees would, would um, name them? Certainly, so I um, show Bob Anderson present. I show a Brittany Bob Bobber present. Uh, staff presenters of, or staff of Lynn Rosselli. I have Mark Milan and I have staff Mike Thompson. That is all. Okay, thank you so much for that. So hopefully David is on there. So um, let's see, we have the re TAC meeting and approval of minutes. Um, those were attachment number three. Um, were there any WAC questions on the minutes? By any of the board members? I am not seeing any hands raised. Then if there, no, uh, we will if there are no questions, this is Jack Baker. I would oh. move approval. Okay, Dick, did you have a question? Since I see I your hand. Yeah, since I wasn't visually. a member of WAC, and when this meeting took place, I'll be abstaining from voting on the minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll make sure. Motion. Okay, um, before we do that, thank you. We have a motion in a second. I would like to know if there are any public comments. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via phone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Are there any live comments to the WAC minutes? I'm not seeing any hands. I see no hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, Drew, are there any um, written or voicemail comments to the minutes? No pre-recorded comments. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. And Easter, did you get who made the motion in the second? I did not, I apologize. That's oh, okay. Jack Baker made the motion. Mackenzie seconded. Thank you. Okay. So with that, um, Easter, can you take a roll call vote, please? Yep. City of Katati? Yes. City of Petaluma? Yes. City of Brunner Park? Aye. City of Santa Rosa? Abstain. City of Sonoma? North Burn Water District? Aye. Town of Windsor? Yes. Valley of the Moon Water District? All right, so for item three, that is unanimously approved with one abstention. Thank you so much. Um, Drew, would you like to take the um, TAC meeting minutes? Thank you, Madam Chair. So this is a similar action item for the TAC members. So um, before moving forward with getting any public comment or taking action, I'd just like to ask the TAC members if they have any questions or comments on the meeting minutes as submitted. Uh, 
Okay, seeing none and hearing none, um, also like to ask if there are any public comments on agenda item four, which is the July 13th TAC meeting minutes. Uh, and if you're participating on this call um, to please uh, raise your hand in Zoom or if you're dialing in to dial star nine, raise your hand. I see no members of the public requesting to speak. Thank you, Gina. And there were no earlier pre-recorded comments um, that I had as well. So at this point in time, I'll uh, request that there be a motion and a second to approve the meeting minutes from the TAC. Drew, this is Jennifer Burke with Santa Rosa. I'll move approval. Thank you, Jennifer. And Sandy, I'll second it. Thank you, Sandy. It's been motioned and second to approve the meeting minutes as presented. Uh, Easter, can you go ahead and do a roll call vote, please? City of Katati? Aye. City of Petaluma? Yes. City of Burnett Park? Aye. City of Santa Rosa? Aye. City of Sonoma? Yes. North Marin Water District? Yes. Town of Windsor? Aye. Valley of the Moon Water District. Abstain. Okay. And that is item four, unanimously approved with one abstention. Thank you so much for that, Easter. So we will move on to item number five, the Water Supply Coordination Council. Um, we did meet on uh, July 21st via another Zoom meeting. Um, it was um, a quite interesting meeting and we went through, as you see the agenda here and there was a lot of discussion on that. And so um, I'd like to ask if there are any members of the WAC who have any questions or comments on this item. I'm seeing no raised hand Easter, do you? All right, then we will um, see if there are any public comments on item five. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, Secretary Perez, are there any comments from the public on this item? I'm seeing no raised hands. Nor do I. So with that, um, we will move on to the water supply conditions and temporary urgency change order, which was attachment number six in your packet. And I believe, Don, that you're going to take this item. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, Don Seymour, Sonoma Water. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yeah. great. Yeah. So um, last week on uh, July 28th, the State Water Resources Control Board issued an order approving our temporary emergency change petition as we had requested it. it contains a number of terms uh, for fisheries and water quality protection, also water conservation. Um, total of 12 terms in all, and most of them have re reporting requirements um, that'll be due next April. Uh, in response to uh, the order being issued, Snowmobile Water reduced releases from Coyote Valley Dam by 20 CFS last week, 20 cubic feet per second. Storage at Lake Mendocino is currently about 53,500 acre feet. This is about 2,000 acre feet above the target water supply storage levels that Snowwater engineering staff developed this year for Lake Mendocino, so that's good news. As of today, the flow at Healdsburg, which is the compliance point for the Upper Russian River uh, minimum stream flow requirements is about 76 CFS per cubic feet per second. And at Hacienda Bridge, which is the compliance point for the lower Russian River, flows are about 91 C uh, cubic feet per second. So both the upper and lower Russian River are still at or about the flow schedules required by dry water supply conditions in Sonoma Waters uh, uh, water rights. Um, we 
We currently intend to make release decisions at Coyote Valley Dam based on uh, maintaining a prudent buffer above the target water supply storage levels. So at this time, we don't intend to make any uh, additional release changes at Coyote Valley Dam. However, that could change if we see that buffer start to decline. At Lake Sonoma, storage is currently about 196,000 acre feet. For comparison, the storage level is about 5,000 acre feet above 20 feet, 2015 storage at this time and about 35,000 acre feet above storage in 2014 at this time. And uh, Sonoma Water is currently releasing about 120 cubic feet per second from Warm Springs Dam. And with that, does anybody have any questions I, I can answer? Easter, are you seeing any hands? I am not. Sorry, I'm not seeing any from the tapper whack at this time. Uh, okay. I do have a I do have a question, Susan. This is Drew McIntyre. Well, of course. Please. <laughs> um, Don, thank you. Thank you for that report. Um, a couple things. Can you talk a little bit about the how it the process worked this year with respect to a changing of the staff at this at the state? And do you think that had any impact on just the overall amount of time that it took uh, through this process? So yeah, you know, we did have new staff we we were working with, but I don't think that was um, what kind of created, a, I think, what a, with a longer um, process in approving the order. I think really it came down to COVID-19, you know, and, and uh, state board staff having to be, work remotely. And then also they were under the gun at about the time we um, filed our petition to um, approve water transfers that by legislation that they were required to do by a certain date. So it was the combination of uh, them may having to handle those water transfers and then just, you know, also dealing with the, the, the um, shelter in place. Okay. Right. I, would, I, I would, I guess I would also add, we, um, the new staff is, is, is excellent to work with uh, that, that, have, that, have, that have come in. They're, they're really um, enthusiastic about understanding more about the Russian river system. And as soon as, we're able to have more contact with folks. We, we really want to bring them out and, and take them out on the Russian River and show them the system and, and our diversion facilities and, and, and give them more of an opportunity to become acquainted with the Russian River. That's, that's good to hear. And then um, another question, Don, just can, can you remind everybody what will ultimately um, cause the end of this temporary emergency change? Is it is it based upon a time or an actual weather change or what's what's the trigger? The term is 180 days, Drew. Okay. Thank you. That's all my questions. Okay. Hey Don, I'm I know before you have reported. Um, percentages on Sonoma and Mendocino, the percentage um, full. Do you happen to have those numbers? You know, I I do not have those numbers at hand right okay. now. I guess right now we're really, um, for, particularly for Lake Mendocino, focusing on those target water supply storage levels that we were trying to, to have adequate storage in Lake Mendocino in the fall when Chinook salmon come into the system. But I, I'd be happy to send those to you. That would be awesome. It, it's kind of a number that I think that uh, a lot of the general public kind of understands. They don't necessarily understand the um, the CFS and things like that. So Susan, this is, this is Drew McIntyre again. Were you asking about the current storage levels in the lakes? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I just pulled it up. Lake Mendocino. Oh. Lake Mendocino right now is uh, about 69% of its target. Perfect. And Lake Sonoma is around 81%. Perfect. Thank you. 
I guess that you're off the hook then, Don. Uh, thanks for that, Drew. That's one of the beauties um, of having three computers open right now. Nice. <laughs> so, are there any <laughs> other whack or tack questions or comments? I have Dr. a comment. Dick? Yes, Dick. Uh, I, I would like somebody sure. from Sonoma Water uh, to talk about, I, I totally support this, but I did get uh, some emails that people were concerned about the impacts uh, both on the fish species uh, and on the recreational access and function with these reduced discharges, just so we can kind of get an idea what uh, we're, we're going to be looking at. Don or Pam, do you think that you can take that one? And then we are later in the agenda, uh, Dick, going to be talking about an, a very aggressive water conservation campaign that's the Saving Summer Water Partnership is uh, undertaking as well as a, a specific one for TUCP. But there was a very aggressive campaign mounted to uh, urge additional water conservation throughout the Russian River as part of this. So, Don, I know you or Pam can go in a little bit more detail in terms of exactly uh, how we're going to manage this, please. So, so as I mentioned earlier, we're actually meeting minimum and stream flow requirements for the water supply condition we're in in our water rights, which is 75 CFS on the upper Russian River and 85 CFS on the lower Russian River. So even with the approved temporary urgency change petitions, we're still able to uh, have reduced flows to the minimum that they allow, which is 50 on the upper river and 60 on the lower river. I'd also add, as I, as I mentioned, there's a number of terms that we need to, that we're obligated to meet in the order uh, with regards to the state board approving those petitions. And these are, um, most of them are, are protecting fisheries and coordinating with uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife and National Marine Fisheries Service, also the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board on water quality issues. Part of the um, approval process for our petitions was preparing a water quality work plan that was reviewed by the Regional Water Quality Control Board that we're implementing this summer. And um, as Grant said, uh, there, um, there's uh, a term in our order requiring coordination on um, uh, doing three three day forecasts um, for irrigation and uh, both by ag and then also diversion by municipal that are customers of the Russian River Mendocino, Mendocino County Flood Control and, and Conservation Improvement District. So we've started that outreach with their general manager to start receiving those forecasts, which will aid us in understanding um, how to better manage that will, will hopefully allow us to better manage the upper Russian River keeping our buffers to a minimum, uh, preserving storage in Lake Mendocino. And then really the whole purpose of this, of, of filing these petitions was to preserve storage in the reservoir for critical life cycle of, of salmonids. And so that we had, have op in the opportunity to have the best water quality possible for releases when the Chinook start entering the system, but also having adequate water supply to meet flow conditions where, um, uh, uh, fish passage won't become an issue. I don't know, Pam, would you like to add to that? No, I think the only thing I would add is on the recreation side, uh, as Don said, we are maintaining, at least we're attempting to, as long as we have a bit of a buffer and storage at Lake Mendocino, we are planning to maintain minimum stream flows that are higher than the petition allows, we realize that there is always an impact um, to recreation when flows get very low. Um, at the same time, we are doing this really to preserve storage, mostly for the fish returning in the fall. So um, there's, we, we're gonna try to maintain flows as high as we can to reduce that, that impact to recreation um, but as Don pointed out, we we are trying to maintain those flows right now, at least while we still have a bit of a buffer at Lake Mendocino at flows that would be allowed under our water rights 
without any sort of petition. So these flows would be occurring in a year even without a petition. So I hope the public kind of understands that. So Dick, did that answer your questions? Yeah, thank you very much, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think you guys are doing a great job trying to um, keep all the different aspects. It's sort of hard to have all these balls in the air and, you know, there's recreation and there's, you know, crops and there's, um, you know, salmon and, you know, there's a lot of different, different aspects of that. Just, you know, just to, you guys are doing such a great job. I just have to say that I just returned um, from Idaho and we actually have a river um, that adjoins our property and up there, they just sort of take the water. So it was sort of uh, sad for my grandkids to have one evening have water and the next morning, basically, they turned off all the water. So um, you guys do a great job of trying to keep all aspects um, covered. It was kind of sad for, mm. for the grandkids to have to go along and, and pick up fish um, and try, try and move them around as best they could. But um, anyways, you guys do a great job at trying to balance um, all those balls. Um, so thank goodness we are where we are and you guys are doing what you're doing. Um, so with that, um, we will take um, public comment on this item. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via phone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, Secretary Perez, are there any comments from the public on this? I am seeing no raised hands for this item. Okay, nor am I. So, um, Drew, did you get any comments on this item? Madam Chair, I did not receive any comments prior to the meeting. Okay. So if there are no other comments from the board and I am seeing no raised hands, quickly jump your hand up there if you have any more comments. I am not seeing any. So then we will move on to item seven, the Sonoma Marin Waters Partnership. And I believe that, um, Drew, you're going to take the first item. I am. Thank you. So again, this is agenda item 7A. First thing I'd like to let everybody know is there's a correction um, that needs to be made on the first page on the partnership. The Healdsburg data was incorrect. Uh, and we'll be sure to get the corrected page posted on the website. Um, and if with the correction on Healdsburg, uh, the June water usage is actually not 8% below, but actually 10% below. And more importantly, as we continue to try to stress um, with the variabilities of the month to month, it's much more accurate to just look at year to date water usage. Uh, and we're comparing this to the 2013 state benchmark. So year to date water usage usage is down 14% versus what it was in 2013. And we have recently, I'm going to continue to point this out. We recently also included uh, a chart, um, chart two, which is on page two. It really shows that the 2013 benchmark, I just want to reiterate, that's not really, you know, when people started to implement water conservation or water use efficiency measures. Uh, this has been happening for, for decades now, and it's best illustrated in this uh, chart here that you can see on the screen, chart two, that looks at gallons per day per capita over time and shows that it was up about 160 gallons per day per capita in the late 1990s, and now is, is down, you know, around 100 and less than 110 uh, gallons per day per capita well below the 20%, um, the savings are, are actually much greater than 20%, which is what the state had looked for for their 20 by 20 benchmark. So I just want to point that out to everybody. When you look at this, and this, this um, chart shows, you know, the population change again, that 
that the water contractors and the customers, obviously the customers have really been making good strides in, in um, reducing their overall uh, inefficient use of water over the years. So I just wanna point that out. It's important to look beyond just 2013. So with that, uh, I'd like to ask if there are any questions at all from the WAC and TAC before opening it up to the public on this item. Okay, seeing none. Uh, as far as it's an opportunity for the public to comment on the 20, 2020 water production relative to the benchmark in previous years, uh, if you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. And if you're dialing on in via phone, you can do a similar by doing star nine to raise your hand. And then I'll ask uh, Secretary Perez to report out if there are any public comments. I'm seeing no hands raised for this item. Okay, thank you. And I did not receive any pre-recorded comments as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and kind of control the schedule here on these uh, agenda item seven related to Sonoma Marine Saving Water Partnership. So we're gonna move on to 7B, uh, where we're gonna have Colin Close with the city of Santa Rosa give a verbal update on the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan and, and uh, where, where we are right now moving forward to all the water contractors preparing uh, this document that's required uh, by the state by June of next year, I believe. Colin? Yes, thank you. Uh, everybody able to hear me okay? You're a little bit quiet. Is that any better? That's better. Okay, terrific. So very briefly, for those who may recall, the urban water management plan is required every five years and urban water retailers are required to do this. Uh, urban water retailers are defined by the state as retailers that deliver more than 3,000 acre feet of water or who have more than 3,000 connections. Um, and essentially in urban water management plan documents your agency's long-term plan to ensure that you have adequate water supply for today and into the future. So these are uh, really comprehensive assessments looking at your agency's water sources, uh, water availability, the demands, and your water reliability out at least 20 years. Uh, regionally, we've been doing 25 years, but the state requires at least 20. This year, there are many new requirements. Um, the drought that we all experienced 2014 through 2016 uh, inspired the state to develop quite a number of regulations, including additional requirements for the urban water management plan. And I won't go into all of the detail for all of what's required, but I will mention that we're gonna have to demonstrate compliance with some new regulations related to our water distribution system audits, where we look at how much water our systems are losing. Uh, we need to assess our resiliency and vulnerability for a five-year drought. Previously, it was a three dry year period. Now it is a five dry year period. So we have to theorize what it would be like in a five dry year period and show what our reliability is. And we need to take a close look at our water shortage contingency plans. There are quite a few new additional requirements for that, including aligning with the state's stages so that it makes more sense to the public when we're in different stages of water shortage. So quite a bit of work to be done, a big lift. Um, I thought it would also be helpful for folks to understand the relationship of this plan to some of the other planning efforts in our region. Uh, they, these urban water management plans are certainly a critical document for each of our water retailers and water wholesalers in our area uh, because it's really about effective water management. And for us, it's about coordinating and communicating regularly on those issues as you're aware. Additionally, these are foundational documents that are used for other planning efforts. So for example, urban water management plans are a foundational document for general plans uh, that cities and counties develop. They are essential for water supply assessments and written verifications of water supply. Uh, they are critical for water master plans. And then again, regionally, our urban water management plans are essential to the Sonoma Waters effort to develop their urban water management plan. 
So there's an iterative process where we will be providing them information. They'll be doing some analysis and bringing back to us their information and results. And it goes back and forth. So we will be working very closely with them over the next few weeks on some of those issues. Uh, they're also critical for the new groundwater sustainability agencies in our area. We have three of them, as you know, and they are asking for the demand projections and other uh, bits of information and data analysis from our plans so that they can integrate that into their efforts as well as they plan out towards a 2050 horizon. Uh, so regionally, we've been working together over the years. Uh, nine member agencies have found it very beneficial to tackle a couple of major pieces of the urban water management planning analysis as a team. So together with Katati, Petaluma, Rona Park, Santa Rosa, Sonoma, and Town of Windsor, as well as the water districts of Marin, North Marin, and Valley of the Moon, we all work together. We hire one consultant to do some demand analysis and water conservation program analysis for us using common methodology so that we're all integrating our own individual characteristics and data and assumptions for our agencies, but the actual analysis is using one methodology so that when we submit our demand projections to Sonoma Water, there's a comprehensive and coordinated effort to make sure that those numbers make sense. Um, I will say that this was very successful in 2010 and also in 2015. So we're doing that again for 2020. And just to give you an update on that regional effort, first and foremost, I wanna thank the staff of all of the agencies involved. Um, we had a kickoff meeting in January with our consultant and we were all moving along, uh, collecting our data. And then COVID, as you know, uh, the crisis hit and folks were working remotely, folks are short staffed. Uh, there's just so many challenges to be met. And uh, we did fall behind by about two and a half months on our schedule because it was just unavoidable. It was just simply too difficult to get some of the details pulled together. Uh, but we are working very hard together. We've all submitted all of our data. Everybody understands how critical it is that we do the best we can to try to catch up on our timeline. So folks are turning around review and additional analysis and data and input as quickly as possible. So I just wanna thank everybody for that. Um, so our consultant is EKI, uh, Environment and Water. They have received everyone's data. They have developed preliminary demand projections uh, that also have embedded in them all of the assumption choices that we each have to make. And so uh, just about every agency has had a chance to go ahead and give us their assumptions and decisions about finalizing those demand projections. Uh, there are a couple of agencies that are still putting their heads together internally and making some final decisions on some of those data points. So next steps, EKI will be working on final demand projections and getting those out to us. I did put in a call and an email last week to get an estimated date for when those would be coming out. But at this point, I haven't been able to reach EKI. Uh, but I do expect that those will probably be coming to us in a couple of weeks at most. Um, and so we'll be getting those. Um, we will be routing those to Sonoma Water so that they have what they need for their urban water management plan as well as to the GSA so they have what they need for projecting demand. Um, and then EKI will continue with some additional analyses work that they will be doing around our water conservation programs, the cost benefit analysis, how much water is projected to be saved and integrating that information as well and then starting to work on some final reports. Just want to remind everybody there is a statutory timeline. These uh, final urban water management plans are due to the state. They need to be submitted on an online portal and it needs to be done by July 1st of 2021. So that's almost 11 months away. Sounds like a long time, but I, again, I want to emphasize just how much work there is to be done on these. Uh, so I think all of us are working away, not only on the demand projection piece, but also some of the other chapters as well. There's a total of 10 chapters. Uh, plus some pretty significant appendices that need to be attached. I also wanted agencies to be aware that there are some other milestones. So you will probably, uh, governing bodies and um, senior staff, you will probably be seeing iterations of uh, efforts before July 1st. There will need to be a public comment period and public review of the document, public hearing. Uh, if there are uh, drought water rates in your plan, there'll be a probably a Prop 218 process you'll need to go through. I'll leave that to you and your uh, legal folks to determine how you would proceed with that. Uh, but then also the board or the council will need to 
formally adopt the plan as well. So all of those milestones will need to be completed before the plan is submitted to the state on July 1st. Um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions that folks might have. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, good summary there. Bef before opening it up for um, questions and comments from the WAC and, or the TAC, I just wanted to thank the city of Santa Rosa in general, again, for being the administrative agent for the consultant that Colin was mentioning, EKI, that's, that's doing all of this um, initial water assessment work. And then uh, I'd also, Colin, just like to give you a shout out again for the good work that you're doing. Colin's uh, spearheading the coordination of this and, and doing a really good job with uh, trying to shepherd the request from the consultant and, and trying to get the input back from all the water contractors in a timely manner. And, and uh, Colin, we, we can't uh, appreciate enough uh, the good work in that. So. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'd like to first just open it up to the WAC. Any questions from the WAC members on Colin's presentation on the current status on the urban water management plan update? I see Jake, Drew. Yes. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, go Gunners, uh, Mr. Davis. And uh, I'm just curious as to whether there are any red flags that need to be raised at this point in time, since we have 11 months ahead of us as you so ably described. Um, anything we should be worried about as contractors? Uh, looking at the initial demand projections, no, I don't see any worries. Uh, I will say that one of the data points that's been a little bit difficult for us to nail down are the population projections. We had hoped that ABAG would have their 2050 projections published <laughs> by this point, but they've been affected by COVID just like all the rest of us. And so they're behind their initial timeline but we do have some other approaches that are reasonable and useful to help us uh, project out population. Uh, so everyone's had a chance to look at three or four different options. And I think everybody is settling on kind of a similar approach to projecting population. So uh, I think that was really the, the sticking point. The other piece, the state provides a guidebook. We are not required to use it, but it's very helpful. It has explanations. It calls out the new requirements very clearly. It has tables that we can use, uh, definitions. It's a very useful document, uh, but the final will not be ready until late November at the earliest. So uh, that's unfortunate, but they have put out draft chapters. I know that we are using them here in Santa Rosa already to try to craft some of our early efforts on some of the chapters that, um, that we need to write ourselves, uh, but I think that's the only other piece is if you're waiting for that guidebook, boy, I would really encourage folks to just start working on it with the draft chapters that are available at this time. If anybody needs those draft chapters, reach out to me. I'm happy to forward them to you, um, but they're very useful. It's been very helpful to have that from the state, but really no worries or concerns other than that. Um, let me just uh, say, Madam Chair, as your city's rep on the ABAG Executive Board and also sitting in MTC as your commissioner, the question of the population and the, the state numbers and Plan Bay Area 2050 numbers is still, as I think you alluded to, still a very lively uh, debate. And uh, it'll be resolved, but exactly how I can't uh, prophesy. Anyway, thank your you very much. Your crystal ball isn't working very well, huh, Jake? <laughs> Is yours? <laughs> no, it's not. No. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Colin, I just have one question. Um, is this plan at all impacted or, or the data and things that you're doing impacted by uh, COVID? I know that we're seeing a little bit of, you know, change in people's behaviors. Yeah, and I think that's something everybody will have to figure out how to address in some of the uh, analyses that they do. The work that's being done by EKI goes through the calendar year 2019. So, uh, oh. well, but there are places <laughs> it, very specifically in the plan where you do have to integrate 2020 data and discuss 2020. So I think all of us will need to develop a sort of narrative piece that if we feel that our uh, water use for 2020 is markedly different and isn't useful for um, really sound projections. I know we will probably make a note in ours that 2020 is not a typical year. Um, 
and that our projections used uh, historic analysis rather than just relying on a 2020 year. Um, but I think really that's the main piece is just you're able to note anything uh, that stands out as different uh, in the in the narrative section or in the notes section. So it should be relatively easy. I think the other piece is going to be for some of our agencies. I know Santa Rosa lost five percent of our housing stock in 2017 due to the fires. Mm -hmm. And so in 2018, we see a dip in water use that then returns in 2019. So we'll want to talk a little bit about that as well. So the, the good news is uh, the guidebook provides a lot of help, but isn't completely prescriptive. You do get to address your local issues and your local characteristics in the narrative and notes section. So um, so we can, we can make note that it isn't necessarily a, a typical year. Thank you. Drew? Any other questions from the WAC members before I take questions from the TAC? Seeing none, any questions from the TAC on Colin's presentation? Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and take, this is an opportunity to uh, receive questions from or comments from the, from the public on this, on agenda item 7B. Uh, again, if you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. And if you're dialing in via telephone, you can do a similar action by pressing star nine. And then I'll ask Secretary Perez to report out if there are any live comments. I see no hands raised for this item. Okay, thank you. And there were no earlier comments that I received uh, as well. So then we're going to move to item number 7C now. Hey, Drew. Yes. Drew, Susan, I just would also like to um, pass on my thanks to Colin for the great presentation and all his hard work. Um, very, very thorough. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And just one more shout out to all the staff. I know all the challenges we're facing and I deeply appreciate how everybody is uh, struggling and yet doing their best to meet the timelines. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. You bet. Okay, item 7C, public outreach campaign. So we're gonna, there's going to be two uh, presentations on this. Uh, the first one's gonna be with Paul Piazza with Sonoma Water. It's gonna focus on the partnerships, summer ad campaign. And then after Paul gives his uh, presentation, then we're gonna move to Brad Sherwood uh, with Sonoma Water as well, and his he will be talking about the specific messaging uh, to the public just related to the temporary urgency change petition uh, that was re reported on earlier by Don Seymour. Uh, so, Paul, um, you're up. Thank you, Drew. <clears throat> um, so, each year you're probably aware that the partnership undertakes a water use efficiency multimedia campaign that lasts approximately four months from June through September, which of course coincides with the higher demand summer months for water use. Uh, the campaign includes broadcast radio messages, online video placements on connected TV and on streaming music sites like uh, Pandora and Spotify you're probably familiar with. Uh, as well as uh, still ads for both digital and print media. And as you can imagine, this year was kind of a unique challenge having to create a message during a pandemic, um, which was creating a lot of additional stressors in people's lives. So we wanted to be sensitive to the heightened fears of contracting the virus and recognize that many in the community were struggling uh, with school and childcare issues, loss of work, uh, financial difficulties and more. So uh, our approach was to create the still ads uh, to provide visible reminders of the value of water and the importance it, in play, uh, it plays in their lives. And uh, also highlight the role that saving water plays to ensure long-term reliability of our water supplies. And um, Although this, the still ads themselves were not created to include a direct call to action, we knew the temporary urgency change petition uh, would have some impacts and that we needed customers to be taking action to reduce their water use. So 
To that end, we focused the video campaign in the early uh, part of the summer to reinforce correct summer watering practices and to address uh, irrigation system maintenance before turning on their automated irrigation systems for the summer. Um, and then the broadcast radio spots recognized that the stay at home order had created a lot of renewed interest uh, and increased numbers of people engaging and growing their own food and also taking on some uh, both indoor and outdoor kind of DIY projects around the home. So the, the broadcast radio campaign uh, was created with that in mind, uh, focusing again on summer watering uh, practices for gardens, uh, focusing on available rebate programs to save money for irrigation efficiency projects like installing drip or for changing out inefficient fixtures in their home. Um, and then also to bring awareness about um, our regional low water use plant program and some of the local participating nurseries in Sonoma and Marin counties where those could be found. Uh, so that's kind of a highlight of where the campaign uh, landed. By the numbers, we're um, reaching about 275,000 impressions on the digital media placements monthly. Uh, those are on a variety of different online sites, um, a, a variety of which are trusted local news sources such as the PD or the Argus Courier, North Bay Business Journal, La Prensa, um, and then also hitting um, the top 100 news uh, aggregator sites and other websites throughout Sonoma and Marin County that are frequented by mobile device users and others online. Um, the video went out onto what's referred to as connected TV. Um, I am not a subscriber to these, so I can't say I have personal experience in their use, but you've probably come across um, terms such as Roku, uh, or Pluto, um, the Spanish Univision has an online platform for television. So their early season irrigation video placements were targeting those um, sites as well as the streaming radio such as Spotify and Pandora. And then um, again, the broadcast radio spots um, are playing weekly throughout the four month campaign, including on the Spanish public broadcasting station, KPBF radio. And I just wanted uh, an opportunity to give you a few examples of what those look, sound, and um, feel like. So we're gonna queue up um, a couple of 30 second spots. The first of which is one of the video uh, spots that features summer watering. I'll let them go ahead and start that. And there we go. When it comes to a home's irrigation system, a little maintenance goes a long way. Homes with a timer-controlled irrigation system use about 50% more water outdoors than homes without irrigation systems. Before you ramp up your watering efforts, spruce up your irrigation system by remembering four simple steps. Inspect, connect, direct, and select. For more information, visit savingwaterpartnership.org. That represents one of Saving videos. water ensures water to grow. Need help finding the right plants for... Saving water ensures water to grow. Need help finding the right plants for your garden? Look for the Water Smart Plant label. It's the smart choice for plants that thrive with less water in our dry summer climate, providing beautiful, easy to maintain landscapes for your home. For a list of participating Water Smart Plant nurseries, visit savingwaterpartnership.org. That's savingwaterpartnership.org. And then lastly, we're just going to look at some of the examples of the print and digital still ad placements. Uh, again, drawing attention to the fact that uh, we did know the TUCP would have some impacts locally. So 
wanted to emphasize the efforts of our customers saving water and the preservation of water in the river, both for recreational uses and for ecosystem function and for migrating uh, salmonid species later in the fall. And then again, recognizing um, a lot of people were taking up home gardening during the shelter in place orders, wanted to emphasize um, the long-term supply reliability uh, that water saving brings to our families and businesses and that it enables us to continue to do those things uh, even during a pandemic that we would like to undertake uh, and during all the crazy emergencies we've experienced over the last four years a re-emphasize that the water is the one consistent thing that's been available to our customers during all of it. So um, th those are the summer campaign spots. I can take questions now if there is interest or Drew, you want to wait until after Brad talks about the TUCP focus part of the campaign. Yeah, let's ho let's hold off. If, if everybody's okay, let's hold off with the questions and go ahead and move on to uh, Brad Sherwood's presentation. Then we'll come back and then we can take questions for either you, Paul, or Brad. <laughs> Thanks, Drew, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, great to see everyone. Um, in regards to the TUCP, our Sonoma Waters Board of Directors wanted to ensure that we were not only asking our community to use water wisely, as we always have, but to also educate our community about our water supply system. So in light of the TUCP last week, we started a regional radio campaign um, that does exactly that. And you'll hear one of those campaign ads here soon. The, the goal is to educate our community about where their water comes from, but specifically the role of Lake Mendocino and why it's important to help protect our fish species and how the TUCP plays a major role in that effort. We wanted to do so in a way that was supportive of the partnership campaign. And we loved how the partnership campaign remained and had a positive voice and a positive message. So we've really tried to keep that tone in all of our regional messaging, no matter what the issue is on behalf of Sonoma Water. I do wanna thank Jennifer Burke for uh, helping us out in drafting these uh, regional radio ads. And we do encourage and make these available to any and all water contractors, NGOs, the community uh, to use uh, for various community meetings in the future. Uh, we will be doing a follow-up uh, Zoom and Facebook Live interview with uh, Director Hopkins in a few weeks regarding the TUCP. Uh, if you didn't catch our, our first Facebook Live interview in June, uh, Director Hopkins interviewed Don Seymour about our efforts to uh, save water, help the fish, and also celebrate our community's amazing water conservation efforts. So stay tuned for that. We'll make sure you know when that interview is happening so you can watch live. Um, we also sent out a special uh, e-news last week when we did receive the order from the state that links a variety of conservation articles written by Paul Piazza and his team. So we certainly hope you received that email last week. If you did not, please do reach out to um, Grant or myself to make sure you get those future notifications. And with that, Gina, if you wouldn't mind playing the radio ad, that will uh, conclude my presentation. It's been a dry year, the third driest on record in Sonoma County. 
Lake Mendocino is in Ukiah, but is a critical part of Sonoma County's water supply system. Water released from Lake Mendocino into the Russian River provides the water needed to help regional needs, but it also provides the cold water needed for endangered salmon in the Russian River to successfully migrate and spawn in the fall. The less water we use now, the more water is preserved for endangered salmon in the fall. Here are some water-saving tips. Cover pools and hot tubs to reduce evaporation. Don't be a gutter flutter. Reduce sprinkler runtime. Sonoma Water thanks you for your continued water-saving efforts. Learn more at sonomawater.org. Okay, thank you both Brad and Paul. Um, I wanna go ahead and just before getting any additional comments, just wanna take this time uh, to allow the actual individual water contractors to comment a little bit about what additional activities are being done at the local level. I think it's important uh, that the everybody realize that these regional efforts are, are good and, and um, are important, but each individual water contractor also has additional uh, measures in place. And it'd be good to just um, have an opportunity to discuss some of those. So I got to go ahead and just start off at from North Marin Water District. You know, when the question uh, is raised about, you know, what are we doing different this year with, with the dry year conditions, especially with uh, uh, the water levels in Lake Mendocino, just one of the things that we did um, a couple months back is we each spring, late spring, we have a direct mailer that goes out to all of our customers and get it updates them on current conditions. And right on the front page of that direct ma mailer was a message just about the dry year conditions in Lake Mendocino, um, the low water level, and then just um, trying to emphasize the customers to utilize all of our various uh, water use efficiency rebates and, and practices uh, for saving as much water as we can. Uh, the other thing that the district is really happy to have done over the last uh, a little bit over a year now, year and a half, is we've switched over from mechanical water meters to electric water meters, otherwise known as advanced meter infrastructure. Uh, and that allows us this the spring and summer months now um, to get water data usage back on a daily basis rather than it was ev once every other month when we read them uh, previously. So we have we have staff that are monitoring that usage and, and making outreach to customers if we uh, identify high usage for leaks and what have you. And I know we're not the only ones that have AMIs now. Um, I know Katati uh, as fully AMI as well. Um, so those are a couple other things. And then I just wanted to, to close on mentioning that we do have Stafford Lake locally, uh, which is our local source of supply. And we are consciously operating that to maximize um, late spring and summer pr local production to allow deep peak of deliveries off of the uh, Sonoma Aqueduct. So. Uh, those are some of the things that North Marin's doing, and I'd like to just open it up for any other water contractors who would like to add additional information, um, what they're doing within their region. Yeah, Drew, uh, this is Paul Sellier with Marin Municipal. Um, <clears throat> just to add to what you were saying, some of the, we, we've sort of refreshed and some new elements to our water use efficiency programs. So we've got laundry to landscape gray water kits that are rolling out <clears throat> to folks through the urban farmer store in Mill Valley. Um, there's a new approach, sort of a watershed approach to landscaping where there are grants to community gardens to develop model gardens so that folks can come by and see what those are supposed to look like. Um, of course, rain barrel rebates um, landscaping your lawn rebates for, for square footage of lawn replaced, but also an option for free mulch delivered and uh, conversion for irrigation kits. 
couple of the other things are again rebates for smart water sense irrigation controllers and you mentioned AMI um, we're not there yet but we've got about 2,000 AMI meters for our large customers that have been installed or will be shortly I think they're probably at about 1,500 out of that number right now and there's a feasibility study that we're looking at for the full scale deployment of AMI. And along with all of those components, of course, there's messaging that goes on our website, newsletters to customers, um, and then in bills, of course, we have some trifolds going out. And then let's not forget the social media that's become so important today. So that's what we're up to um, at MMWD. Thank you. Thanks, Paul Sillier. Anybody else? It's like Jennifer. Go. Go ahead, Jennifer. Thanks, Kent. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, Susan. Um, so uh, I, I also just want to take a moment to thank both Paul and Brad um, for the campaigns and the programs that they're doing. Uh, we really appreciate that regional message and are doing our best to supplement that in Santa Rosa. So what we have done is um, since the uh, COVID-19 public health emergency, we have figured out how to completely offer our indoor uh, water smart checkups uh, virtually. Uh, we deliver free devices and our home survey kits uh, to all of our customers when they request them. And then we're still providing on-site outdoor inspections, making sure all uh, social distancing and personal protective equipment's in place. Uh, since uh, the public health emergency, we've done 112 audits, uh, which is really good being very short staffed and having to put all these new protocols in place. Um, we have uh, also determined how to offer all of our rebate programs uh, virtually. So everything that we offered prior to the public health emergency in terms of rebates, we offer uh, currently. We have recently upped the rebate amount for our cash for grass rebate, which is uh, providing a rebate of now 75 cents a square foot uh, for anyone who wants to remove turf. Um, and so we're seeing some increased participation in that program. Uh, we have also, uh, like others, uh, we are almost fully uh, AMI as well. And so we've really been using that data and information to look at uh, water use uh, characteristics and information and put into place a pretty robust uh, follow-up program with our customers, contacting them when we notice any kind of increased water use. It's uh, led to uh, over uh, approximately 400 contacts with customers uh, to let them know when they have uh, some kind of pattern that may be a leak. It's a great resource and really has helped uh, customers understand where they have an issue and, and most are very, very thankful uh, because they were unaware that this water usage was occurring. Uh, we also have a connections newsletter that goes out citywide. It reaches about 70,000 people and we've added water use efficiency uh, information, rebate information and tips in that newsletter going out weekly. And then last, uh, and, and also we're supplementing as, ever, as others mentioned with all social media and other outlets, including our bill inserts. Um, and last this month, we just joined the Wyland National Mayor's Challenge for Water Use Efficiency. Uh, that started on Sunday. And so information is going out about that uh, throughout our city. Uh, folks that are interested, they can go to mywaterpledge.org to sign up and commit to saving water and taking other activities activities or implementing other activities that will help uh, improve the environment and fight against any kind of climate change issues. Um, and so if folks pledge and if perchance Santa Rosa is a winner, uh, there is opportunities for um, some prize money as well as for a donation to a local charity of the choice. So anyone who's uh, within the Santa Rosa area and is interested, we'd highly encourage you to go to mywaterpledge.org and sign up and help really focus on saving water this summer. And that's it for Santa Rosa. Thanks, Jennifer. Kent, did you want to say something for Petaluma? So um, Petaluma, we have the WaterWise house calls still going on. Um, so some of are by phone, and then sometimes we meet out with, with the customer to go over like um, the water meter profiles to determine leaks and help troubleshoot any kind of irrigation 
issues for water waste. We still have the mulch madness program going on. Um, that's been pretty popular in Petaluma. And then this week we have messaging um, changes on our website in the Press Democrat. And we have a water meter um, bill inserts um, for going out as well. And then we, we just got daily acts. Um, the council just uh, approved another round with daily acts to do um, workshops and outreach. Um, the workshops are kind of limited participation with, with everything going on, but they have, um, they've been really popular here in Petaluma. So we're glad to have daily acts um, continuing to help us with the, with the program. So we'll look for the new messaging and make sure we're consistent um, with everything. So thanks. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Anybody else from the uh, water contractors, TAC? I see Sandy. Yeah, just briefly, um, at the town of Windsor, we continue to be short staffed in our water conservation program, but um, we are continuing with our uh, water watch patrol and we are able to address leaks using our social distancing protocol. So I'm happy to report that and utility billing um, is providing public information through our bill, our bill inserts. And we also continue to work with daily acts um, on some gardening practices and irrigation systems. And finally, we have most of the infrastructure installed for our AMI program, and we're just completing um, some of the transmitters to uh, complete the full AMI system in the town of Windsor. So that's all. Thanks, Sandy. <laughs> okay. Um, so now is a good time, I think, to just go ahead and, and ask the WAC uh, members, uh, if they have any questions or comments at all of, of this item just related to public outreach with the partnership or the TUCP messaging? I guess I'll start, Drew. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was great. The ads are wonderful. The one that caught me um, was uh, the irrigation one, because I know that um, before my husband turns on his irrigation system in the spring, it basically takes him a whole day to go around and check everything to make sure that all the little heads are right, and all the little lines are right, and and the rain sensors working and, and all of that. So it, that hit uh, very close to home for me. The other thing is, um, you know, the, uh, the water insight, um, the day after we left for vacation, I got an alert that um, said that um, we had something going wrong and we, we probably had a leak and naturally not being here, I panicked a little bit, um, but um, it was slow. It was about three gallons, which everyone said, check the toilets and, and all of that. And we have sort of a unique uh, situation in that uh, we have no water pressure, so we have to have a holding tank, but the holding tank is gravity fed, which is very, 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 very slow. So the day before we left, we kind of were making sure everything was watered, so it drained the tank a little bit. So it actually took a few days for that tank to gravity feed and fill back up. But for a couple of days, I thought we had a water leak and it had people trying to, you know, help me figure out what was going on. So hmm. all of those things are really very helpful. Uh, uh, does allow people to really kind of jump on it. So I was appreciative to get the alert, but now I know that if we water extra, that I have to be mindful that I need to watch it for a couple of days to make sure that it's not just the gravity feed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other comments from the WAC on this item? How about TAC? Any other any other comments from the TAC before we open this up to the public? Seeing none, um, we're now going to take public comments on item number uh, 7C, public outreach campaigns. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. And if you're dialing in via the telephone, you can do similar action by star nine to raise your hand. And then I'll ask Secretary Perez if there's anybody from the public that indicates they'd like to make a comment. Looks like we have one. 
Yes, we do have one hand raised. Uh, Margaret, I will uh, enable your mic. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, this is Margaret DiGenova from California American Water. And I just wanted to give an update on our conservation. Um, uh, in addition to some of the things everyone else was doing, uh, bill inserts and still trying to watch for leaks and, and um, uh, just keep an eye on things going on in the system. We also have a pilot program that we're doing right now within our company and it's with Flume, F-L-U-M-E is the name of the company. They have a device that the customer can strap on to their meter with Velcro and it basically is a way that they can meter, they can see uh, real time uh, meter usage, they can see if there is a leak going on there. So we've done a rebate for our customers. Um, apparently this device cost, I believe something around $200. Uh, we had a introductory program where we've provided if our customer wants to purchase it, it is their device but they can purchase a device and it at a cost of $50. Uh, we've made that available to customers and they were, um, we had a limited number in each district. Um, we have, I think about 25 out in our district. They went basically the first day or two, they were, they were all booked and um, customers took them and are using them. So that was just an additional thing that we're doing there for conservation. Thank you, Margaret. Um, any other comments on this item? Item 7C, public outreach. I see no other hands. Okay. Thank you, Gina. Um, Madam Chair, we're, we're done now with item number seven related to the Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership and we can move on to item number eight. Thanks, Drew. Then we will move on to item number eight, the biological opinion status update. I believe that, Pam, you're going to give this for us? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, great. Okay, all right. Um, and hopefully my dog won't start barking in the middle of this, so we'll find out. Well, um, only if he has something to say. Yeah, exactly. Well, anybody <laughs> walks by the house, he's barking at him. So um, hopefully everybody received the biological opinion update that uh, came out along with the agenda. Um, and uh, I'll just go through this pretty quickly and I'll uh, certainly answer any questions afterwards that I can. So um, on the fish flow project, I don't think the status on this is, as far as the WAC is concerned has really changed since the last time. So I'm not gonna read through the whole thing. Um, one of the updates though, however, with regards to the fish flow project and specifically um, the draft EIR is uh, we were asked about uh, a potential release date for the draft and our staff has, is saying at this point, they're anticipating uh, the recirculation of the draft EIR in the spring of 2021. So there's a bit of an update there. Um, as far as the Dry Creek Habitat Enhancement Project goes, we do have a contractor who is now um, starting to mobilize out to the last of the first three miles of construction work out in Dry Creek. Hanford um, out of Petaluma is going to be doing the work this year to, to finish up that work. The, again, the last of the first three miles. They're also going to be doing some maintenance work. Um, it, it looks like they may have actually done it last week, um, but there's, there is some work in terms of um, going back out and fixing a few things that um, got disturbed during high flows probably last year. So not, we didn't have high flows this year. So, so they're working on that also. We also continue to make really good progress with the Corps of Engineers on phases four through six. So that's mile, the fourth, fifth and sixth miles of the project. And we have designs um, advancing from 99, 90 to 99% at this point. Um, and because of that, we also have 
a really big emphasis going on right now in acquiring right of way for these projects. Um, so our right of way staff are very, very busy working with east with property owners out on the creek um, to acquire easements for these projects. Um, they're also um, working, we along with the Corps of Engineers are working on a, on a formal agreement with regards to the project and, and implementation of the project. So um, that's going on right now. In terms of fish monitoring, um, they're finished with the downstream migrant trapping. So that's where they're trapping the fish that are migrating out to the ocean in a number of devices uh, within the watershed. And now they're out looking for what they refer to as uh, they're sampling uh, for young coho salmon and steelhead in tributaries. So they're out there um, typically with masks and snorkels swimming around in pools looking for fish as well as using electrofishing uh, devices in order to, to find and count fish. Um, in Dry Creek in particular, they're doing an interesting experiment um, along with uh, the folks from the Army Corps of Engineers to try to determine whether fish are using um, the areas that we have rehabilitated within Dry Creek. So uh, the restoration features, they're installing devices like you can see on the screen right now, and they're putting tags, very tiny tags into the fish and uh, about 100 steelhead, and then they're recording their movements. So these devices allow them to identify where those fish are and um, how they're moving around and using the restoration areas. Very interesting project going on out there. Um, as far as the Russian River Estuary Management Project goes, um, the management, we are in the management period right now. The management period go, goes from May 15th to October 15th. The river mouth is currently open. We did finalize our adaptive management plan back in May, um, and they're out there doing a, sort of a normal work that they would do this year, except for um, the sanding work, which they haven't been able to do this year due to COVID, uh, but they are doing biological studies, which includes uh, fisheries work as well as water quality work. So, or water quality monitoring, I guess I should say. Um, and as far as interim flow changes, we did already talk about that. Um, Drew, you asked a question about the expiration date of, of the order. The order actually, I think it's less than 180 days because we, it didn't get uh, completed until just you know last week. Um, but the order specifically expired, expires on December 27th of this year. So, um, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. There is information, quite a bit of information, those petitions on our website. Um, so there's press releases, the orders there, the petitions are there. Every, there's a whole bunch of documents there. So if pe people would like to see those specific uh, pieces of information, if they haven't seen them, they are available on our website. And with that, I'm glad to answer questions. Thank you so much, Pam. Very thorough. Um, do we have any questions from the WAC or the TAC? Madam Chair, this is Drew. I have a couple brief questions. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, first, of, first of all, Pam, I'd, I'd just like to thank uh, Sonoma Water staff for putting in the, the date, um, the tentative date for recirculation of the draft EIR. Um, appreciate that. And then I, on the Dry Creek Habitat Enhancement, I just you know really want to again give a shout out to the fact that the project's moving forward as a as a water agency that just recently went through a stream bank restoration project in Lagunitas Creek. I never really anticipated or had a good feel for the the difficulties it is. Not, not so much just the design, but just the permit, but especially the permitting aspects of it. So uh, just a, you know, we don't, we hear about these reports and there's a lot of information and, and work being done behind the scenes. And uh, I just want to say, you know, good kudos to the, to the agency for having this continue to move forward because it's, 
it's no easy task with all the different um, entities involved. So that's all, that's all I had, Madam Chair. Great. Uh, I, it was mentioned earlier that they're going to um, get the uh, water board down and show this, them some things. And I think that that would be a good thing for them to see. It's pretty amazing what's been done out there at Dry Creek. So I think that that should be on the um, kind of itinerary for showing uh, what we've done down here. Uh, any other whack or tack questions? I am not seeing any hands going up. So um, we'll, t excuse me, we'll take public comment on item eight. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, Gina, do you see any hands? I am not seeing any hands. I do not. You do not see any hands. All right, going once, twice. Then uh, we will move on to item nine, the Potter Valley Project Relicensing Update and Next Steps. And gee, guess what, Pam? You're up again. That's me again. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, so last time we talked, which was um, sort of mid-May or so, um, we had just submitted um, a our feasibility study report to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commissions, the partners and ourselves did. And um, there was a, a comment period that ended at the end of June on that report. It, the comment period wasn't meant to be for folks to file just general comments. It was really meant for folks to comment specifically on the study plans that were proposed in that feasibility study report. Nevertheless, hundreds and hundreds of comment letters were filed that were more or less just opinion about whether or not they liked the idea of what we were proposing. So FERC did receive um, uh, many, many um, comment letters. Of, of all of those comment letters, probably um, maybe three dozen of them or so actually addressed the study plans, which is what, what we were looking for input on. Um, so, uh, Apparently, uh, there, there was sort of no real formal acceptance of that report because it's not a FERC, part of the FERC process. It's not one of the steps in the FERC process, relicensing process. So uh, what we did get, however, from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission was a new process plan and schedule. So this lays out for us the schedule that we're on in terms of the integrated licensing process. And we received that on June 3rd, it was dated June 3rd. So we are now um, restarting, I keep refer to, referring to it as restarting the integrated licensing process in accordance with that process plan and schedule that we received from FERC. So um, our first order of business is to file um, a report with FERC in mid-September. And that report is an interim um, study report that talks about where all of the studies that were begun by PG&E several years ago now, uh, where those report, where those studies are at, um, what's been completed, what's left to do, what they've discovered so far. So um, there's a whole bunch of steps after that that include um, some mandatory meetings that are public meetings, um, as well as some back and forth with parties, mostly probably resource agencies that might have um, studies that they want to see um, that may or may not be directly related to, um, to the license itself for, for the Potter Valley project. So there's a lot of um, work to be done and it's very specifically set out in that schedule between now and about uh, early January. So we're in the process of hiring um, what we're referring to as our ILP or integrated licensing process consultant we went through a solicitation process to find a team to do that work. We are negotiating with one of the teams that proposed right now. 
on a scope of work schedule and budget. Um, and hopefully within the next week or so, we will have that finalized. Um, so we, we um, are working with that team. They are very aware of the tight timeline in terms of schedule. And um, that's kind of our first order of business though, is to get them hired on so we can get that um, interim report uh, filed with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, so that's kind of where we're at on the FERC process. Um, there, there's other work being done also <clears throat> sort of in the background. Um, we have some work groups that continue to work, um, some work groups that were kind of on hiatus for a little while that will, will sort of start up again. These are small work groups that are internal to ourselves in conjunction with our partners on this. So for example, um, one of the things that um, was on hiatus for a while was looking at a formation of a regional entity. So discussions about that with our partners will start up again pretty soon. Um, we also are working um, on, I know Brad is working very hard, Brad Sherwood is working very hard um, on communications and um, we're trying to get out there in, in us specifically Sonoma Waters trying to get it out there into um, Northern Sonoma County to talk with both the communities up there as well as residents and agricultural producers so that we can understand um, what their needs are and really try to educate them about, about what we're doing and, and how they can help us and how this may in the end any changes to the Potter Valley project may impact them. So, so there's a lot of work going on with regards to that right now too. So there's, there's several things happening, um, but as far as regulatory goes, it's this integrated licensing process that we are now sort of in a race um, between now and, and mid January or so to, to get everything done that's required by the schedule that FERC has uh, provided to us. So um, with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. We do have um, quite a bit of information up on our partnership website, the twobasinsolution.org website. So if folks want um, to see these documents, for example, the report that we filed or um, other, other sort of general information about the partnership, um, that that information is available on that website. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Pam. Great presentation. A lot of stuff going on, and I know you've been working really hard and really appreciate all the real hard work that you've done and, and doing your best to try and uh, keep uh, us informed of what is going on. And I know there's a lot. Um, looks like Jennifer has a question. Jennifer. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, it took me a minute to get myself off mute. Um, thanks, Pam. Thanks for the update. Uh, I just had a question. You mentioned um, that there are a number of mandatory meetings coming up, uh, probably likely with uh, resource agencies. I was just curious. I know um, initially when pg and &E was going through the relicensing project, there were a number of public meetings that were held to get input and different work groups. Is that a similar process that's going to happen with these meetings or is this more meetings just with the planning partners and uh, FERC and resource agencies or do you, or do you know? Yeah, so there, there are, and I'm not super familiar with this whole thing, so excuse me if I get something wrong, but so for example, one of the public meetings that will be coming up, a mandatory meeting that will be coming up is in, in mid-September, we file this uh, interim study report. The end of September, there's actually a meeting to talk about that. And that's a public meeting. It's not just with the resource agencies, it's a public meeting. So, um, so people can come and, and tell us what they think of that report and what's missing, what's, you know, that, that type of thing. Um, and then that starts the whole process of finalizing the study plans starts at that point. So 
currently there's something on the order of 22, I think it's 22 studies that are being proposed. I think PG&E was, was working on 21 studies when they stopped their process. And after January, once the study plan is finalized and adopted by FERC, that's when the studies will start up again. And those work groups that you're referring to, Jennifer, are were associated with the resource areas that are part of the studies. And that a process similar to what you experienced before, where um, say somebody wants to talk about fisheries, um, they would hold various meetings on, say there's two studies about fisheries. They would hold uh, meetings about those two portions of that, of that resource area. That uh, process will be probably pretty identical <laughs> starting uh, when these studies start up again. So those are, those are specific to the studies and it, it, those are completely open to the public um, anybody who's interested can say, you know, I'm interested only in frogs or I'm only interested in hydrology or whatever the case may be. And they're welcome to participate in those particular work groups um, that are, I don't know if I'd call them work groups, but those resource area groups that are set up and the meetings are set, they're all publicized and anybody can participate. Um, which in whichever one they want to participate in. Great, thanks, Pam. That was very helpful. Um, any more questions, Jennifer? Just a second, Drew. It looks like Larry has his hand up. I do. Um, I have a quick question for you, Pam. Thank you for the update. Is this thing going to happen? Do you think the Potter Valley? Is there going to be a solution? <laughs> Um, I think there's a chance there will be a solution. I think there's a chance <laughs> solution. It, it's really, I don't think we have enough information right now to really answer that question, which is one of the reasons why the studies have to happen. And um, but it, it really, there's just a lot of unknowns right now. And there's a, you know, that the project has a lot of risk associated with it. And we haven't been able to, nail down um, that, that risk question. And um, it's not just a cost question. It's not just a environmental impact question. There's a, a big risk question too. So it, we, and we haven't answered that yet. So the studies will get us there and we'll be able to hopefully answer some of those questions. Our first challenge is really coming up with the money to do those studies. So, um, and that that we need to, you know, come up with by the January timeframe. So that's one of our big focuses right now is to um, to figure that out. Um, because the party, just the five parties can't afford to pay for those studies right now. So we are, we're working on that. And um, I, I, I'm not even gonna give it a percentage, but it's possible and it's not possible. So what else to tell you? How much is the total? For, roughly? Sorry. The studies? The studies? The studies are probably somewhere between 10, uh, 10 and $20 million. Oh, that much. Oh, that's a lot of yeah. dough. It's not like a okay. couple million, which, you know. Yeah, yeah. Pretty doable. Wow, well, yeah. that all, Larry? Thanks. Yeah, that's it. So, Pam, what happens if we can't afford the studies? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm looking at Grant. I really don't know. <laughs> we don't know, basically. <laughs> I think it's worth pointing out, Pam did a really good job answering that hypothetical that Larry threw out. Um, it is worth noting that the path we're on right now is a long pathway of FERC licensing and therefore it is expensive and these studies are going to cost and they've got to be come from somewhere. The alternative pathway is a surrender process that looks very much like this FERC licensing process in which those studies are required by PG&E <laughs> to conduct. So I, I want WAC members and, and the TAC knows this to just be aware that 
you know, we have to stay engaged. We're going to try and go go pathway one and make the case. And Pam's doing a fabulous job of keeping all of the folks uh, informed. And it's really a, a challenge uh, time-wise to ensure that our planning partners and the ad hoc and Congressman Huffman and all those are informed. So um, bear with us as we go. We don't have that answer, Susan. We haven't been faced with that yet. We may be faced with it at the end of the end of the year, beginning of the new year. Uh, Director Rabbit's on this call, and he will be uh, very involved in, in helping us determine um, collectively what we can do and, and what may or may not be possible. I guess we need to ask Santa for some funds for Christmas. <laughs> Drew, yes. I think yes. Yes. Drew, I think you had a question. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, on a related on a related note, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, a notice that FERC issued on July 28th. It was a notice soliciting scoping comments. So, in this document that was issued by FERC, they indicate that they will be moving forward with preparation of an environmental impact statement for the Potter Valley project. And this is the third time now that they've issued a, a request for scoping comments that are related to their environmental review. And the deadline for that is August 27th. So what I'd like to uh, propose, and hopefully there's no objection from the WAC is since there's very little time is to have the TAC look at this um, document that came out and um, go ahead and prepare a response uh, and have it be sent out by Susan as the, as the chair of the uh, Potter Valley, the WAC Potter Valley Project Subcommittee. So basically have the, the WAC Potter Valley Project Subcommittee, which is made up of uh, Susan Harvey is the WAC chair. It's also made up of representative, the WAC representative from city of Santa Rosa. So that would be uh, Dick Dowd and also the uh, WAC representative from North Marin Water District. So that would be Jack Baker uh, working in concert with the TAC to prepare a response letter. And then just uh, the WAC as a whole will realize that that'll just have to come out uh, from the WAC subcommittee, the WAC, uh, the entire WAC will not have an opportunity to, to uh, see that be in an effort to meet that deadline. So I just wanted to, uh, this is a similar process that we used when we commented on the planning agreement partners um, feasibility study report. Uh, it was all drafted and prepared on, under this similar process. We did have a chance to bring it to the full WAC before submitting it, but in this case, I'm just requesting that, that the WAC, there's a consensus from the WAC that they're okay, that that gets submitted uh, after approval from the WAC Potter Valley Project Subcommittee. So hearing, if I don't hear any uh, big shout outs in opposition, we're gonna move forward. And, and again, uh, we'll work with the WAC Potter Valley Project Subcommittee over the next a uh, few weeks in August to make sure that we have a document that's ready for submittal by that cutoff date. And then obviously we'll include uh, a copy in the next WAC meeting um, that's scheduled later on this year. That's all Any I have. Thanks. Any comments by the WAC members before I open this to the public? I'm not seeing any hands. All right, last chance. Um, then I will open this up for public comment on item nine. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via phone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, oh, it, um, Gina, it looks like we have two folks, at least from what I can see. That's correct. So I will enable Mark Milan to um, be able to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Mark. Thank you, uh, Chair. Hi, greetings all. I just wanted to echo something that Pam brought up about the uh, the twobasinsolution.org website. 
just this morning was posted the schedule, a detailed schedule of the key milestones and meetings uh, from this August all the way through April 2022. Uh, so I think this could be helpful for people to track the activity for this effort. And uh, so I just wanna mention that that's just recently put up there today. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. All right, and Mr. Keller, let me enable your mic. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, Pam, thanks for the report and thanks to Water Agency staff for the diligence uh, and leadership that they're working on this. It's been extremely helpful. Um, could you comment, Pam, on what I would describe as the recalcitrance in Mendocino County for moving ahead with uh, what has been agreed to be the, the core of the two basin solution? Um, it seems like the, the presentations to the Farm Bureau, presentations elsewhere from Mendocino County folks is pretty reluctant to even agree to the core principles. And uh, wondering if you had any comments or, or thoughts about um, how you guys are working with them and whether you think they'll be brought along. So I, I have not uh, been privy to those um, presentations. I wasn't there. Um, so I'm not really sure what you're talking about, David. Um, yeah, most, most I, I can tell you that that our working relationship with them has been great. They've been super helpful. Um, they have a consultant um, who's been really, really helpful. And they've been extremely um, collaborative and cooperative. So I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what you're seeing or hearing, but um, yeah. our experience has been good. Um, and most recently, this was uh, a column posted in the Ukiah uh, Daily Journal by Devin Jones from the Farm Bureau, um, really doubting the, the basic workability of the two basin solution um, and challenging. And then it it's, echoes language we'd seen from Janet Pauley as well. Uh, if I might add to that, um... I, I believe the water contractors are aware of this, but um, it, Mendocino County has been able to, to uh, dig deep, um, put an initial $100,000 in on our joint efforts to get a application into FERC and has since uh, agreed again to go for another 100,000 uh, obligation to continue to move along the critical process to get there. So um, I think it's fair to say uh, Mendocino County Farm Bureau is not a member of the planning partners. They do have strong opinions, as do uh, many of the other planning partners. Um, I viewed that article, which I did see in more in response to a uh, article that appeared jointly by Cal Trout and Trout Unlimited with regard to uh, the commitment to uh, a long-term solution. So, you know, I wouldn't... Um, read too much into it at this point. Uh, everybody is still holding firm to their original positions, but we've learned a lot in the process. The fact that we've held together and have jointly fundraised is pretty remarkable. And what gives me uh, a reason to keep going, I guess, you know, there'll be, there's certainly enough off ramps because of this whole surrender process. You all know that, but we need to stay engaged and to be looking for every possible way forward to come up with a pathway that'll work for the region. Great. All right. I, I appreciate the, the optimism and the determination. Uh, it's been well represented since the planning agreement partners started. So much appreciated. And again, if, uh, uh, if uh, Friends of Deal River can play any um, role in helping work that through in Mendocino County and Lake County, we're happy to do that. Thank you for that, David. Uh, any other public comment? I'm not seeing any more hands. Are you, Gina? I do not. Okay, then I will um, bring it back and we will move on to, um, thank you again, Pam. Um, I know it's not easy to report on this and things are changing, you know, minute by minute. Um, 
So we'll move on to item 10, the Regional Water Supply Resiliency Study Work Plan, phase one. Drew, I believe it's you. Yes, thank you. So um, it's appropriate, you know, we've had a lot of discussions about dry year conditions and it's appropriate that we're also working on something that is that the water contractors and the agency feel is, is very important, just related to a regional water supply resiliency study. So um, what the TAC essentially has, has been working on since, and obviously Sonoma Water for uh, most of this last six or eight months, especially is uh, the work plan that's attached here. And, and that was, that was done based upon uh, work by the agency's consultants. It's funded by the water contractors. The consultant is Jacobs. There's been a lot of outreach uh, in preparing this work plan, uh, individual meetings with all of the water contractors. And this essentially culminates and wraps, wraps up that initial scope of work. Um, and uh, the TAC, or actually the the WAC has seen this multiple times, most recently at the May and July meetings. Uh, after this project or this document is approved, it moves into phase two, um, which Sonoma Water will be, is anticipated to execute uh, that phase of work with Jacobs in the not too distant future. That'll most likely start this late summer. It'll be about an 18 month duration. Uh, and phase two will build upon the initial input that was obtained during this work plan develop, development. And uh, it'll develop, evaluate, and prioritize the various resiliency options, again, to just improve overall, overall coordination uh, between um, the water contractor and uh, the agency, the water contractors and the agency, just looking at uh, our entire water system, removing any any uh, barriers at all from one agency to another and trying to look at it uh, from a region-wide standpoint. So we're really looking forward to this uh, continuation of this work uh, on a regional basis. And so um, I guess I'd like to just ask if there are any questions from the WAC and TAC on this item before opening it up to the public. Looks uh, like Jennifer, Jennifer has a question. Question Thanks. Comment. Thanks, Drew. And um, so uh, thank you. Uh, I think from at least Santa Rosa's perspective, we're very um, interested in and excited to see this study continue to move forward. And um, I did have a question, uh, maybe more for either Grant Davis or for Supervisor Rabbit. Um, I think we're all trying to better understand and continue to reinvest in resiliency in response to the, the national disasters that we've had or the um, natural disasters we've had in this area in the last few years. And I know uh, similar to Santa Rosa, Sonoma County recently received some settlement money from PG&E. And I was just curious if any of uh, that uh, funding may go towards some of the projects that may be considered as part of this resiliency study and or if uh, some of that funding may lead to some changes on how we continue to move forward uh, with the resiliency funding, with the resiliency study. Sorry about that. Uh, Jennifer, I'm going to defer to Director Rabbit on that one. <laughs> Mr. Rabbit. David, I think you're on mute. Jennifer, maybe what I can, while he's, uh, let me start a, a response in hopes that he'll weigh in uh, more directly than I can. This came up during um, our water supply coordination council meeting and set up for this meeting. Um, and from, to my knowledge, uh, you, you guys watch our budget like everybody. We've, in one say, one way, shape, or form, put about $4.8 million toward the resiliency and the recovery efforts, uh, all toward um, 
projects that make us more resilient. Uh, we focused a lot of our um, efforts on uh, fire cameras, and which has now grown into a statewide network. A lot of one rain uh, water and sensor gauges that are gonna be deployed throughout the original burn area that are gonna be real time that hopefully get hooked up into NOAA's weather, weather service, providing real time response, um, helping to fund the Office of Resiliency and Recovery and, and, and whatnot. So a variety of things that we've invested in. Um, I told uh, the board last week during our, our budget hearings of something that I desperately wanna make sure we don't have happen again. And that was um, during the Kincaid fire when the evacuation order by the sheriff was uh, mentioned, we had a very short period of time to get completely out of our administrative offices and our office maintenance center down here uh, off aviation. And uh, the panic literally that goes through when you have to remove your servers and relocate them to a safe position, which ultimately ended up being all the way down at Sonoma Valley Treatment Center, our county sanitation district. Uh, I just said to myself, if we ever have an opportunity to rectify this, so we have a redundant operation, a way that we can actually not ever lose connectivity with our SCADA system, I'll be, we're gonna do it. And I looked at our Jens Salzgeber, our, our IT manager and, and our operations folks. I just said, we, we gotta make sure we get a mobile unit that is satellite driven that can respond in a uh, crisis to different locations and have a backup to our SCADA. So I've uh, shared that with the board and the county administrator. So there are projects like that, that we'd like to employ uh, as part of the settlement funds that are directed toward fire response and recovery. And with that, um, I'm hoping Director Rabbit might be uh, back on now. Uh, otherwise, I'll keep talking. <laughs> He's still muted, it looks like, Grant. Well, uh, maybe for good reason. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I appreciate the question. I'll assure the water contractors that we know that you are looking over and helping to advise like we're doing today on everything that we do. Uh, this is one where I think we have a very strong case to be made that at least the amount that we've put in that are real unrecovered costs would come back to go into additional resiliency efforts that we, we've uh, suggested. So, you know, that's sort of where I'm personally at. Hopefully the directors will be at the same way, but thanks for asking that question, Jennifer. Thanks, Grant, and I think that's uh, very helpful. Appreciate the information. I think this work plan and sort of where we're going is good first steps, and as we continue to all have lessons learned from these various experiences and bring them back into how we can improve our resiliency is just gonna be much better for our communities. So thank you, appreciate that. Hey, any other questions on the WAC and TAC before I open up the public comment? Not seeing any. Okay. Um, all right, so we're now taking public comments on item number 10, the Regional Water Supply Resiliency Study Work Plan. Again, you can raise your hand via Zoom or dial star nine if you're on the phone. I do not see any raised hands for this item. Thank you, Secretary Perez. Um, and there were no um, earlier comments submitted either. So I'm not gonna do a formal roll call on this, but essentially just ask if there are any objections to approving the work plan as presented from the TAC. Seeing no objections, uh, just let the meeting minutes reflect that. Wanna move now to item number 11, the emergency training and coordination program. So this is another uh, item that the TAC has had multiple times to review uh, and comment on. So it's now ready to be finalized uh, and approved. Uh, it really, a, co a couple things, just wanted to, especially for the WAC representatives, just to uh, reiterate that this, this document was generated based upon the 2019 Sonoma County Civil Grand Jury well, there'll be water after an earthquake. And one of the findings in the grand jury report was the coordination between 
uh, SCWA and the contractors could be improved by utilizing increased training and mutual aid training. And that generated a response um, or uh, a recommendation essentially uh, for that to take place. And so this is, a, this is an action item that specifically addresses that recommendation. Uh, part of this uh, plan essentially sets up a subcommittee that'll include a representative from each of the water contractors, as well as Sonoma Water, uh, Sonoma Water, um, Stephen Hancock will actually be the chair of the subcommittee. And the goals of the subcommittee are, are multi-tasks, essentially, uh, I'm not gonna list all of them, but a couple of the highlights are just to enhance the working relationships between the, the water contractors and the agency, just in terms of emergency coordination uh, develop mutual aid processes. So that's really important. All, all of the water contractors are most likely members of uh, Cal WARN, Water Agency Response Network, which is at the state level to share uh, resources. Um, and that's always available and, and highly encouraged, but anytime you can also have more localized um, mutual aid agreements, it just makes it much more uh, responsive and being able to quickly share information. So that'll be one of the big tasks that'll come out of this, this group. And then finally, just to increase regional readiness and, and response by practicing field command control and coordination uh, efforts. I mean, uh, tabletop exercises and training. I mean, they, we, we have to have those and it's really important. And we're looking forward to having those uh, scheduled on a more regular basis. Uh, so anyhow, it's a, it's a good step moving forward. Uh, this emergency training, you know, is, is important not only in, in earthquakes, um, but also pandemics uh, as, as we're dealing with right now. So uh, excited to get this subcommittee established. Uh, any other questions from the WAC and TAC before I open it up to the public? Again, on agenda item number 11, approve the emergency training and coordination program. I don't see any hands, Drew. Okay, thank you. Uh, take this time to open it up for the public. If there are any comments to uh, raise your hand via Zoom or hit or dial star nine on your phone. I do have one hand for Margaret. I'm gonna unmute your mic. Hello, Margaret. Hi, I just wanted to say that we do want to participate in anything that does that the committee does uh, come up with. We want to be a part of that if possible. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions from the public? I see okay, no here. other speakers. All right, hearing none, so similar to the last item, I'm not gonna take a formal roll call, just uh, ask if there are any objections to approving the program as presented from the TAC. Seeing none, I'd just like to ask that the meeting minutes reflect uh, that it was approved and there are no objections. And uh, Madam Chair, I'm ready to move right on to item number 12, COVID-19 coordination and communication, if you'd like. Take it away. Okay, uh, this is just real brief. Uh, I want to take this opportunity just to let the WAC members know, um, because the TAC has been involved on this on a regular basis, that uh, TAC representatives from from the water contractors meet regularly on, a, on the phone at this point in time um, on issues related to COVID-19. We've been having weekly calls with the agency and uh, a regularly scheduled agenda where we talk about mutual aid, we talk about developing consistent messaging. Uh, we share information about the availability of uh, PPE equipment and also on safety standards. And I, I, at the last TAC meeting, I gave a shout out to the Sonoma County Water Agency. I just want to do that again, uh, take advantage here at this WAC meeting for 
uh, coordinating these calls, these kind of dovetails to what was just recently done with the approval of the emergency training and coordination program. Um, and again, it's, a, it's an opportunity for all of the water contractors and the agencies to, to try to be more efficient by sharing information uh, with the coronavirus, the agency actually ended up being a distribution center for uh, face coverings. And uh, some of the contractors were able to then uh, get the distribution right from the agency instead of having a coordinator out of Sacramento. Uh, there's also been some uh, benefits shared between the contractors on, you know, messaging out to the, to the public. And it just really helps to be efficient and regional in our efforts uh, on COVID-19. So I just wanna let the WAC members know that um, this has been a regularly ongoing effort and we will continue to do that throughout this pandemic period. I'd like to go ahead and just ask if there are any additional comments or questions from the WAC and TAC on this. Seeing none, I wanna go ahead and just open this up to any public comments. Again, if you wish to make a comment via Zoom, raise your hand or press star nine on your phone. I do see one hand. So Mark Milan, I'm going to enable your mic. Thank you, Gina. This is Mark Milan with Data Instincts. I also serve on the water reuse uh, Board of Trustees for the state of California. And some of you may have been following some of the updates on COVID-19 uh, through water reuse regarding sewage surveillance, which is where they've been able to see uh, COVID in affluent in coming into plants. And some agencies around the country have been really good at uh, analyzing this and making some assessments um, based on the amount of affected in a community. And in particular, as this goes on, uh, there's some thinking that it could be useful as the epidemic leaves a community, you'd be able to, you wouldn't see it anymore in, in sewage. So I just was curious if, you, if this group has discussed uh, sewage surveillance at all, or if it might be a useful tool uh, in the future as this, thing evolves further. Uh, thank you, Mark. I don't, I know that there, uh, in our earlier calls, actually, there was a request for if any local contractors or the agency had freezer space for um, holding of wastewater samples so that they could be analyzed later and I can't recall even who made that request, but. It was, uh, I think Dan Garrity out of, uh, up in Las Vegas. I know he was involved in that. Okay. Um, and again, I'm not advocating that we do it or not do it. I, I realize it would be, could be cumbersome for any of the wastewater treatment plants, but I just thought it was a, of interest. And I know that some communities around the country are pursuing it, some aren't, and, um, I just thought I would mention it for general awareness. Okay, thanks, Mark. Any Anybody else have anything related to Mark's comment that they'd like to share? Uh, uh, Drew, this is Jennifer. Jennifer. Um, thank you. With Santa Rosa, um, just in terms of the regional system that we um, operate uh, serving the communities around here, we uh, did offer to participate in a couple different studies early on. Um, it, we offered within, you know, a day or two of when they became open. And by the time we had offered, they were already completely full. So um, we have had some requests from community members to encourage uh, that kind of study. We are more than happy to provide samples and data. Unfortunately, we don't have the um, expertise. Uh, so it would have to be a study that's either done by some type of probably school or some type of health agency. Um, not sure if there's any interest in our local health officers trying to develop some type of study, but we are more than happy to par to provide samples. Um, it, it, so we've put that out there in numerous ways, but so far we, we have not been able to be part of any studies at this time. 
I know that water, the Water Research Foundation is just announced a study last week, and they they may be looking for utilities around the country for that study, which is a funded study. Thanks, Mark. That's helpful. I'll uh, ask my team to follow up on that. And we're, like I said, we're happy to participate um, if if anyone would like us to. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments from the group or the public? I am seeing none at this point, Drew. Okay, Madam Chair, I think we're done with agenda item 12 and we're back to now item 13. Great, and thank you. And thank you for bringing that up, Mark. It's always uh, helpful when we can get um, some outside on uh, different aspects. And thank you for your report, Drew. Um, and thank you for the work on everybody coordinating. Everybody's trying to do the same things and, and keep one another informed. And, you know, that's the one thing that I really love about Sonoma County is no matter what the aspect of what's going on, we do an awesome job of working together uh, in a coordinated fashion. So thank you for that. So with that, we'll, we're, we'll move on to the Water Agency Government Affairs update. And I think, Grant, you're going to do this. Yeah, although if Brad is on the line, he's been doing a lot of work on both the state and federal level. I think if we could tag team this, I would be, be uh, would like to do that. Brad, are you still on the WAC call here? I see him. Do you want to maybe give an overview? You have some items on the economic stimulus proposal and some legislation and can report out on, on the state side and maybe I'll report out on AQPI and OMB if that's okay. Sure, happy to do that. Thank you, Grant. Um, Sonoma Water is following the development of an economic stimulus proposal in Sacramento right now. As you may be aware, there's a proposed $100 billion economic stimulus plan that relies on what they're calling feature tax vouchers, um, along with speeding up other spending during the coronavirus pandemic. Essentially, that plan would allow State Treasurer Fiona Ma to issue tax vouchers that proponents um, say could raise billions of dollars and uh, uh, potentially provide some relief uh, to economic purposes. Uh, we are continuing to follow this development and um, pushing for more information on how to better understand the proposal and, and specifically how it could uh, potentially uh, help uh, water resource uh, programming as well. Uh, there's been a, a number of COVID-19 response uh, bills and packages, and um, we're still following all those as they develop. Um, there have been several Senate committees have, have yet to notice their hearings and what bills will be heard. Uh, assembly committee chairs are, are simply refusing to, to hear anything being controversial. So the legislature is not being overly uh, productive at the moment. There's just a lot of unknowns and a lot of uncertainties, but we uh, continue to monitor those developments. I will say that on one specific project that does involve Sonoma Water in our regional Bay Area water agencies on our AQPI project, that's the Advanced Quantitative Precipitation Information Program, uh, we are moving forward with doing some intense uh, legislative outreach and to develop ongoing funding, operational funding for these five new radar systems to better detect precipitation in atmospheric rivers. Uh, later this fall, and we'll send you out more information as this develops, but later this fall, we will be um, unveiling two additional radar units that will be set up in the Bay Area and we are going to be setting up uh, legislative meetings to inform and educate legislators throughout the Bay Area on the need to ongoing fund these radar systems. As you might recall, the Sonoma Water through the Bay Area Irwin Integrated Regional Water Management Plan received about $20 million from DWR to help uh, secure uh, five radar systems for better precipitation uh, forecasting. So now we are looking at uh, the next round of essentially operating and keeping these radar systems up and running. On the federal side, we continue to work with uh, the administration's Office of Management and Budget 
on uh, various appropriation requests associated with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, specifically, we've been working with the Corps on some much needed maintenance and operation funds for water filtration, hatchery related projects up at Lake Sonoma and the uh, Milt Bryant hatchery. We've also been following with Congressman Huffman's office the development of the Water Resources Development Act. Uh, this act is uh, in draft mode and does appear to be moving forward and most likely will go to a vote next year. But in this current version, uh, Congressman Huffman and Congressman Thompson have been successful in getting language included that helps us in our muscle prevention programming up at Lake Sonoma and Lake Mendocino, along with funding opportunities for other water core projects, water control manual upgrades for Hero, uh, projects of the such. Um, I will say that we've had a quite a few successful congressional meetings with various uh, Senate Natural Resource Science Committee staffers on our AQPI project, on the need for continued uh, biological opinions funding. And uh, we are, we're saving a lot of money and we're saving the earth by not having to travel to DC to do these meetings. So it's actually been quite successful with the Zoom calls. And um, I will say that we are retooling how we reach out to uh, staffers via Zoom where you might only get five or 10 minutes with a staffer when you're with them person to person in their office. We're finding out that via Zoom, we're actually getting much more time with them. So it's been uh, really an interesting development in government affairs and um, just uh, hats off to our ledge team in Sacramento and DC. Uh, Grant, I, did you wanna follow up on the OMB uh, Dry Creek funding or anything within RCS? Well, uh, Brad, that's a good job. I, in the interest of time, I'll just say that we, Brad's right. Uh, all those years that we've spent working with relationships, some of the folks that have stayed around on the key committees or in OMB and have actually visited Dry Creek, we were able to jump right in and give them an update over a Zoom on, on thanking them for the close to 30 million for phase four, five, and six. And then give us a chance to talk about some of the less well-known or identified O&M needs at the core at the two dams, including emergency water infrastructure. And as Brad mentioned, hopefully planning for a water control manual update. Um, a big push that we've made, these are all related, but we need to now uh, demonstrate that the forecast informed reservoir operations actually works. We were able to save a significant amount of water going into this very dry year. And at the end of the year, um, Jay Jaspers and his team leading up the FURO effort are gonna have a final viability assessment. And as part of that, it's a uh, beginning of a water control mandate, an adaptive water control mandate. We need the funds to do that. So um, hopefully we're able to do that without having to be it present back there with uh, all of you that have done that in the past. We can talk to folks because we've already met them. And, um, the other thing with the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, USDA, we've got a number of uh, facilities throughout the Central Sonoma watershed that need to be updated. They're getting old and they, they need to be uh, reconfigured and, and, and uh, maintained. So there's a new planning document that we were able to secure and some implementation dollars that are forthcoming. So I guess I would just say as WAC members, we, we value your participation and your involvement in our help to build the case with our needs for water infrastructure integration and resiliency in the North Bay and the North Coast. So those are all a good reports. That one thing I would just say too is, I think you know that the governor released the water portfolio uh, last week and we're delving into the details of that. We had a lot to do with some of the language in that document that made its way that we should be able to bring back into the region. So um, cutting that short, I'd like to just jump right into item 14, uh, integrated water management plans, because I, I, I really want those at least to be in front of us, whether there's activity or not. Brad mentioned the AQPI project. That project comes out of the Bay Area integrated water management planning. So it's half of that funding that was released last time. So those radars are critically important to Sonoma Water, this region. We're gonna be getting one in Marin County, I believe, and hopefully that's going on the top of TAM. And it's gonna make us able to respond much 
more quickly and more accurately in terms of um, a need to plan and get things out of harm's way and, and some of our first responders. So our part in that is, is delved into that Bay Area. And then lastly, on the North Coast Inter Resource Partnership, there will be some leadership changes. Uh, the current chair, uh, Judy Morris, is, is not going to be uh, serving and is, is relinquishing the chair uh, later this year, probably by at the October meeting up in Weaverville, it'll probably be a Zoom. So there'll be additional leadership um, uh, required at the North Coast Resource Partnership, another area that brings in significant dollars into the projects from uh, the Oregon border all the way down to here. So that's kind of the uh, state government um, update and, and federal government affairs update, as well as the IRWMs and the, and the regional cooperation. So appreciate all the involvement that you've had in these. Many of you uh, on this Zoom have been integral to keeping this going forward and the success. And even in this tough time, I think that we're making progress and continuing to build on the investments that we've already made. Thank you for that grant. Um, Black and TAC members, are there any? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Jake. Uh, just, to, just to say that uh, Judy Morris has done a great job over the last number of years with the North Coast Resource Partnership. And um, I'm sorry that she will be leaving, but uh, she's certainly done a sterling job. And at some point in time, I would hope that we would acknowledge that. Good idea. Thank you for that. Um, any other comments from the Wacker TAC? I'm not seeing any hands raised. So then um, we will see if there's any public comment on item 13 or 14. Um, if you wish to make comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. And if you're dialing in a phone, please dial star nine. And Gina, I don't see any hands raised. I don't either. Okay. So with that, um, we will um, thank you for that grant. We will move to um, item 15, items for the next agenda. Any thoughts from the Wacker TAC on agenda items? Madam Chair, this is this is Drew McIntyre. I just want to mention again, besides our regular on uh, uh, reoccurring items, obviously on Potter Valley, um, you know, we'll most likely still have another report out on the COVID actions. And then as we move into this uh, fire season, we'll most likely have a PSPS update on that agenda as well. Correct. And as um, Pam um, stated that there'll be a report in mid-September. So since our next meeting is November, we should be able to find out what was in that report and any progress on there. Um, I'm not seeing any hands from the Wacker TAC. Then I will um, open this up to the public. And again, if you wish to make a comment, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in the phone, please dial star nine for the public comment on items for next agenda. Gina, I'm not seeing any. I do not either. Okay, so with that, um, I know this was a long meeting. We had an awful lot to cover. I appreciate everyone's patience um, getting through this. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, thank you to all the staff that have, you know, kind of worked really hard on all these aspects of things. Um, please, everyone, be safe, and um, we will see you all um, probably again on Zoom um, November 2nd. And with that, uh, we will check out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.